you guys. I'm going to turn now to uh, God's Word and the beginning of a, a new series that will unf unfold over uh, seven messages, including this one, on the sacrificial system as we, found, as we find it in the book of Leviticus. I've often thought about engaging with this book. Well, I engaged with it many times, but like preparing uh, a series of teaching on it. Because um, the book of Leviticus is possibly the most underrated book of the Bible. Uh, very, very few people have read it in its entirety. Um, you know, we tend to stick with the Gospels, don't we? We tend to stick with <laughs> the, the books that are, I don't know, possibly easy to read that, that we feel a bit more relevant towards. Uh, so yet, yeah, by far, the book of Leviticus is the least read book among Christians. And yet, yeah, it's by far the one that helps us understand the cross of Jesus and our salvation uh, the most. So for some time, I've been thinking, okay, how can I approach this? And should I talk about this now? And I feel now is, is the right time. And it came quite naturally as well, because it comes on the back of our last series, Genesis Theology. Uh, which was, in my own experience, the most popular teaching series I've ever made. Um, it's been very popular, not just in this church, but I, I know of a number of people that have been following us online, you know, from all sorts of places, really interested to see the book of Genesis, well, at least the first three chapters unpacked. And uh, if you remember, we finished uh, our last series, Genesis Theology, uh, with Adam and Eve, uh, failing miserably, you know, to uphold their obedience and faithfulness. Uh, they listened to the lies of the enemy, and um, they, they fell. They disobeyed God. They took of the uh, fruit that they were meant to eat, and that's how sin was begotten, not just into their own nature, into the human nature, but indeed into the universe. But in all that means, we also saw God's grace at work because he provided Adam and Eve with the means to preserve their relationship with him and preserve a measure of access still to the presence of God. And it was on that day that God killed an animal for the very first time and used its skin to cover Adam and Eve's shame. You remember they tried to do it themselves by sowing fig leaves, which are by far the worst leaves to use <laughs> to cover your privates. They're so thick and they're so, oh, you know, itchy. They're just the worst. And, uh, and, and so they tried to cover their own shame. They tried to cover their own sin. Obviously, it was a miserable attempt. Uh, but we see then God stepping in and slaying an animal to uh, uh, produce the skin that he would then use to cover their, sh their, their, their guilt and their shame. It was on that day that God created the precedent for a sacrificial system, a system that would allow the innocent to die for the guilty, to spare the guilty person's life. This is the principle that would later be built upon by the book of Leviticus, but that ultimately is fulfilled in Jesus, okay? The moment that we just uh, uh, recollected and celebrated around the communion table. As the incarnate Son of God would die for guilty humanity. Uh, but before we actually uh, uh, move on, um, normally you know that whenever I do a series, I don't just start by listing, okay, point one. I try and create a bit of context and give you a bit of a broader overview of the realities that we're gonna be looking at with, in more detail. And I understand that trying to do that with a book of Leviticus without any form of visual aids can be quite difficult, not for me to deliver, but for you to understand, because <laughs> there's a lot in it. It's a very intricate book. And, um, and so what I thought I'd do this time around is turn to a video. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Bible Project. It's a, um, it, it, it's a ministry that has also its own YouTube channel. And I would encourage you, if you are reading the Bible, and maybe you're starting to read a new book or a new epistle, go to uh, the Bible Project on YouTube and find the video about the book that you're about to read. Because in a few minutes, 
uh, they basically give you the full broad overview of that book uh, in a very clear, concise way with the aid of obvious, obviously visuals. And uh, so I thought instead of just replicating what they already done beautifully, but without visuals, I'm going to turn to that video. I'm going to play it so that you can get that initial overview and that will then enable us to delve into the sacrificial system as outlined in the book. So I'm just going to turn off some of these lights and Tony is just going to play it on the screens for you. The book of Leviticus is the third book of the Bible and it's set right after the exodus of the Israelites from their slavery. When God brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai and invited Israel into a covenant relationship. Now they had quickly rebelled and broke that covenant. And God had wanted for his glorious presence to come and live right in the midst of Israel in the form of this tabernacle. But Israel's sin has damaged the relationship. So at the end of the previous book, Exodus, Moses as Israel's representative could not even enter God's presence in the tent. The book of Leviticus opens by reminding us of this fundamental problem. It says, the Lord called to Moses from the tent. So the question is, how can Israel, in their sin and selfishness, be reconciled to this holy God? That's what this book is all about, how God is graciously providing a way for sinful, corrupt people to live in his holy presence. Now, let's pause for a second and explore this really important idea that God is holy. It's fundamental to understanding this book. The word holy means simply to be set apart or unique. And in the Bible, God is set apart from all other things because of his unique role as the creator of all, as the author of life itself. And so if God is holy, then the space around God is also holy. It's full of his goodness and his life and purity and justice. So if Israel, who is unjust and sinful, wants to live in God's holy presence, they too need to become holy. Their sin has to be dealt with. Thus, the book of Leviticus. Now, the book has a really amazing symmetrical design. It explores the three main ways that God helps Israel to live in his presence. The outer sections are descriptions of the rituals Israel was to practice in God's holy presence. The next inner sections focus on the role of Israel's priests as mediators between God and Israel. And inside of that are two matching sections that focus on Israel's purity. And then right here at the center of the book, there's a key ritual, the Day of Atonement, that brings the whole book together. The book concludes with a short section where Moses calls on Israel to be faithful to this covenant. Let's dive into the book. The first section explores the five main types of ritual sacrifices that Israel was to perform. Two of these were ways that an Israelite could say thank you to God by offering back to God these symbolic tokens of what God has first given them. Three other sacrifices were different ways of saying sorry to God. So here an Israelite would offer up the lifeblood of an animal while confessing that their sin has created more evil and death in God's good world. But instead of destroying this person, God, of course, wants to forgive them. And so this animal symbolically dies in their place and atones, which means it covers for their sin. And so through these rituals, the Israelites were constantly being reminded of God's grace, but also of his justice and of the seriousness of their evil and its consequences. The second set of rituals lays out the seven annual feasts of Israel. And each of these retold a different part of the story about how God redeemed them from slavery in Egypt and brought them through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And by celebrating these feasts regularly, Israel would remember who they were and who God was to them. Now the sections about Israel's priests, you have Aaron and his sons first ordained to enter into God's presence on behalf of Israel. And then in this matching section, we find the qualifications for being a priest. The priests were called to the highest level of moral integrity and ritual holiness because they represented the people before God, but then also represented God to the people. Now, we find out why the priest's holiness matters so much back here in this first section. Right after the family of Aaron was ordained, two of his sons waltz right into God's presence and flagrantly violate the rules. And so they are consumed by God's holiness on the spot. 
It's a haunting reminder of the paradox of living in God's holy presence because it's pure goodness, but it becomes dangerous to those who rebel and insult God's holiness. And so it's important that Israel's priests become holy and also that all of the people of Israel become holy, which is what the next intersections are all about. Chapters 11 through 15 are about the ritual purity required of all the Israelites, and chapters 18 through 20 are about the moral purity of the people. Here's what's underneath all of this purity and impurity language. Because God is holy and he's set apart, the Israelites need to be in a state of holiness themselves when they enter into his presence. This was called being clean or pure. God's presence was off limits to anybody who was not in a holy state, and this was called being unclean or impure. Now, an Israelite could become impure in just a few ways, by contact with reproductive body fluids, by having a skin disease, by touching mold or fungus, or by touching a dead body. Now, for the Israelites, all of these were associated with mortality, with the loss of life, which gets us to the core symbol of all these ideas. You become impure when you're contaminated by touching death so to speak. And death is the opposite of God's holiness because God's essence is life. Now this is really key. Simply being impure was not sinful or wrong. Touching these kinds of things was a normal part of everyday life. And impurity was a temporary state. It just lasted a week or two and then it's over. What was wrong or sinful was to waltz into God's presence carrying these symbols of death and impurity on my body. Don't do that. Now, the last way of becoming impure was by eating certain animals, and the kosher food laws are found right here in this section. Now, there have been lots of theories about why certain animals were considered impure and off limits. To promote hygiene or to avoid cultural taboos, the text just isn't explicit. But the basic point of all of these chapters is really clear. All together, these work as an elaborate set of cultural symbols that reminds Israel that God's holiness was to affect all areas of their lives. This corresponding section over here is about Israel's moral purity. The Israelites were called to live differently than the Canaanites. They were to care for the poor instead of overlooking them. They were to have a high level of sexual integrity, and they were to promote justice throughout their entire land. Now here at the center of the book, we find a long description of one of Israel's annual feasts, the Day of Atonement. Odds are that not every Israelite's sin and rebellion would be covered through the individual sacrifices. And so once a year, the high priest would take two goats. One of these would become a purification offering and atone for the sins of the people. And the other was called the scapegoat. The priests would confess the sins of Israel and symbolically place them on this goat, and then it would be cast out into the wilderness. Again, this is a very powerful image of God's desire to remove sin and its consequences from his people so that God can live with them in peace. The book concludes with Moses calling Israel to be faithful to all of the terms of the covenant. And he describes the blessings of peace and abundance that will result if Israel obeys all of these laws. He also warns them that if they're unfaithful and dishonor God's holiness, it will result in disaster and ultimately exile from the land promised to Abraham. Now, if you want to see how Leviticus fits into the big storyline, it's helpful to look at the first sentence of the next book of the Bible, Numbers. It begins, the Lord spoke to Moses in the tent. So we can see that Moses is now able to enter God's presence on behalf of Israel. The book of Leviticus, it worked. So despite Israel's failure, God has provided a way for their sin to be covered so that God can live with sinful people in peace. And that's what the book of Leviticus is all about. <laughs> that was a lot of information to take in, in uh, what, eight, eight minutes, something like that. Good job trying to uh, translate that. <laughs> yeah, if someone can turn them lights on, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so uh, you can actually watch this video again on YouTube, on uh, the Bible Project uh, uh, channel. Uh, you can actually read better on uh, bigger screens. But yeah, so you can actually watch that again. But in essence, the book of Leviticus, like it was explained, was given by God to his people, to his sinful people, to provide them with the means to 
restore and preserve their holiness so that they may be able, well, so that God may be able to dwell through his physical holy presence in their midst. In that, re- in that respect, Israel was to be a unique uh, nation because God would physically dwell um, among them. And so the book of Leviticus highlights a theme that runs through both Old Testament and New Testament, namely the theme of God's holiness and the necessity for his people to be holy as he is holy in order to have direct access to his presence. Because like we also saw in the video earlier, failure to do that for anything that falls short of God's holiness to enter his holiness would be utterly consumed by it. Somewhere else in scripture we read that God is an all-consuming fire, right? It's, 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 it's his mere presence, it's his mere absolute absence of, of sin, his complete separation from everything that is evil that becomes dangerous to anything that is tainted by it. I sometimes use this illustration to explain this point by, you know, uh, just, just pausing the absurdity of trying to live in the sun, right? None of us could ever live in the sun, could we? We'd be just burnt away. It, we wouldn't even be able to touch its surface. We'd just melt <laughs> and, and be disintegrated way, way earlier um, than that. I mean, we cannot even stare directly into the sun for too long without burning our, uh, our eyes. So with God, it's even more than that. Uh, in Scripture, we find uh, these uh, kind of uh, uh, little uh, windows on the realities that is in the heavens. And we find that even the most holy angels have to cover their eyes when they are in God's presence. We are told of the cherubims that are not these little cute, uh, like baby angels, all naked and all cute flying around. No, the cherubims are actually the most powerful angels that you find in the heavens. They have six wings, you know, three pairs of wings. Uh, With one of them, they cover their eyes because they are the angels that are appointed to steward directly into the presence of God. And even they have to cover their eyes. They have to somehow shield themselves from the most holy presence of God. And if that's the case for them, how much more it would be uh, for us. So just looking at that uh, breaks down or dismantles two major misconceptions that we find in popular Christianity today. The first one is that heaven is for those who are good enough. And I mentioned this time and time again from this pulpit. No, heaven isn't for those who are good enough. If anything, heaven is only accessible to those who are as holy as God himself is is holy. And for the reasons that I've just explained. Because if something that we're falling short of that holiness were to enter his presence, at best would stain God's perfectly holy environment, okay, Um, and at worst will be utterly consumed by the holy presence of God. But the other major misconception that uh, um, that this book really dismantles is the fact that we can achieve holiness on our own. That somehow, despite our mistakes, despite our sins, despite our failures, we can somehow make up for those things ourselves and restore our state of holiness and righteous standing before God. This book makes it very clear that that's not possible. That the only thing that can make us holy or restore our original holiness isn't good deeds, no matter how many. Because a lifetime of getting it right does not undo a moment of getting it wrong. We can try and drown our getting it wrong with as many getting it right moments, but it will not undo the moment of failure. The only thing that can restore our holiness and therefore our access to God is for someone else to take the blame for our sin and suffer its consequences. 
and the consequences of sin is death. Whether it be a lie, whether it be theft, whether it be murder, whether you stole a pen from the bank, or, <laughs> or you murdered your neighbor, it does, doesn't change it. Whether you've gossiped or raped to someone, it doesn't make any difference. You know, it all leads to death, and death is complete separation from God. And you might think, wow, this is an overreaction. Well, it would be an overreaction if we looked at it from our perspective, our flawed and, and darkened perspective. But when we look at it from God's perspective, it's a completely different set of, uh, a set of standards because his, uh, his standards are perfect and they're ultimate. He is absolutely holy. It's only the sacrifice of an innocent life for the life of a sinner that can remove sin from the guilty party. And this is why Scripture, and especially Leviticus, put so much emphasis on holiness, because it's literally a matter of life and death. This is why in both Old Testament and New Testament, our calling to be a holy as He is holy is actually the same. And this is where the Old Testament and the New Testament come together because sometimes when we just read the New Testament, we think that some of the instructions and callings and commands and promises that we find in the New Testament directed towards followers of Jesus, you know, we, we may fall into the mistake of thinking that they're unique, you know, that God spoke these things just toward us. But actually, when we come to read the Old Testament, we quickly discover that the things that God is calling us to do and promising to us and warning us about are the same exact things that He spoke to Israel Himself. In fact, in the New Testament, we discover that the church isn't replacing Israel, but it's actually incorporated into Israel. The church is actually the spiritual Israel. But that's an, an entirely different topic, so I'm not going to go there. But it's just to say that whether it is Old Testament or New Testament, the calling is the same. Be holy as your God is holy. And this is what makes the book of Leviticus actually a very relevant book to us today. This is why many people would kind of fail to read that book and engage with it. Because they think, well, who cares, you know, about how to slay a goat or, you know, what to offer if I wanted to provide a, a peace offering or a, or, or a thanksgiving offering? Who cares about, you know, grain offerings? Because at the end of the day, Jesus came and fu fulfilled it all. Yes, but also actually no, because whatever we find in Leviticus is speaking into realities that are still very much relevant to us today that are fulfilled by Jesus, but they need to be replicated by us through Him, through the Spirit of God within us. So discarding the book of Leviticus as irrelevant is absolutely uh, a big, big mistake. <clears throat> However, when it comes to sacrifices for the sake of holiness, this is where we encounter a twofold problem. Something that is hinted at in the book of Leviticus, but it is fully revealed in the New Testament. And, this, and the first problem has to do with fitting substitution. As already explained, sacrifices were the life, uh, were the, sorry, I'll say that again. Sacrifices were the life of an innocent party is offered in place of a guilty one. And they were essential for the forgiveness and the restoration of holiness. But... There is no way for the life of an animal to be a fitting substitute for uh, the life of a human being because they are qualitatively different. Forget about what they say today that, you know, we are animals, that we are just a better version of monkeys. No, it, <laughs> we're not on the same ground. And we saw this in uh, the Genesis theology series, okay? We are qualitatively different uh, because... Human beings, unlike animals, have been created with a divine spark. They've been created in God's image. And if you want to know what that means, well, go back to that series. <laughs> it's still on YouTube, so you can catch up with it. But in any case, we are uh, of an utterly different quality compared to that to, uh, uh, of animals. You know, this is why when you're... You know, there's, you experience different levels of sadness when your husband dies and when your dog dies. Yeah? 
If someone abuses animals, you experience sadness and outrage. But when, God, when, when somebody abuses children, the outrage is on another level. Because the thing that is being abused is of qualitatively far greater uh, uh, value. So, already in the book of Leviticus, this question is you know, presented in a very implicit way because God is saying, okay, you can allow an, an innocent life to die to redeem your guilty life. And already in between the lines, some people may have wondered, how is a God's life worthy as much as my life or his life or her life? It just, there's something just isn't adding up because it's almost like bartering a pound of chip wood for a pound of gold that's just how wide a margin of value there is and this is why the apostle paul later on would write in one of his epistles for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and gods to take away sins now this is this is a key word take away so can you all say with me take away okay we're not talking about mcdonald's or kfc we're talking about taking away sins here, right? It is impossible for the blood of uh, uh, goats or bulls, of lambs, whatever animal, to take away sins, take them away from humans. So this is the, big, the first big problem with sacrifices. You know, the, quali- the, you know, the, the issue of uh, finding a fitting substitute for a human life. Which leads to another problem. Because the only fitting substitute for the life of a human is the life of another human. However, this is where (laughs) we we encounter a different type of problems. And the fact that, you know, for this exchange of holiness for sinfulness, an exchange of of innocence for guilt uh, to happen, the, the party who is being sacrificed needs to be holy and innocent. So, if only a human being can uh, really be a fitting substitute for another human being's life, and that human being that is being sacrificed must be perfectly holy and innocent, where on earth are we going to find people like that? (laughs) Not only people that would be willing to do it, but people who are actually perfectly holy and perfectly innocent. Are you with me? Because say done in an act of like heroism, because like yes, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be your sacrifice, Simon. I'm gonna die for you. Well, I'm gonna ask him. I'm gonna mean it. Are you perfectly innocent and are you perfectly holy? No, you're not. <laughs> uh, if you don't, you know, just ask his wife. She'll tell you. <laughs> so in that case, if he were to die for me. At his death, he would pay for his own debt. He would pay for his own sins and for his own transgressions. Yeah? So how on earth are we to find not just a fitting substitute, but someone who is perfectly holy and perfectly uh, uh, without sin, you know, perfectly innocent? Not only that, where can we find a human being whose life is so qualitatively bigger and greater than our individual lives that at his death, not only our individual sins would be redeemed, but like the whole of humankind's present, past, and future, and the whole of the created universe. You see, the book of Leviticus, in between the lines, is raising these questions and is creating within the Israeli mind, the thought that these means of access to God, these means to restore and preserve uh, the nation's holiness, were only temporary. They were insufficient. They had to be repeated over and over and over again. It was just like putting uh, a patch on a sinking ship, if you like, to kind of delay its... uh, it's, uh, it's inevitable doom. It's somehow through the book of Leviticus, God was preparing God's people to wait for something better. For a better sacrifice. For an ultimate sacrifice. For a once for all sacrifice. 
It's beginning to develop within uh, Israel's mind the thought that the perfect sacrifice could not come from earth, that there was nothing on earth that could be offered that would be fit enough to save the world. Somehow it had to come from somewhere else. Somehow it had to come from, from heaven. And as the Apostle Paul puts it, there's no, there's no distinction for all have sin and all fall short of the glory of God. There was nobody down here that could have filled in that role. Those sacrifices were sufficient to cover sin. Okay? A little bit like with Adam and Eve, when God slayed that animal and then clothed Adam and Eve with that skin. God did not remove Adam and Eve's sinfulness. Okay? He covered it. He put something in between their sinfulness and His most holy presence so that they could continue to have some sort of relationship with Him and some sort of access to Him. Again, with the whole tabernacle and the fact that God would enshrine His presence between something that acted as a barrier between Himself and the people, be it a tabernacle, be it the, the temple in Jerusalem, be it the holy priesthood who stood in between the people and the presence of God. God always had to preserve His relationship and access to the people of God by putting something in between Himself and his people to cover the sinfulness that otherwise would be consumed by his most holy presence. So those sacrifices, they were all sufficient to cover. Okay? They were covered by the blood of the animals. They were covered by those albeit insufficient lies that were shed for uh, the guilty party. But they were not able to take away is the key. They were not able to take away the sin of the world or the sin of individuals for that matter. But this is where we come to Jesus. This is where everything changes when you come across the God-man. The one who was fully God but that was born fully man in such a, a paradoxical way. You know, every time Theologians try to explain how that works. They always ended up producing some kind of heresy. Either one that diminished his divinity or one that diminished his humanity or one that presented him as like Hercules, half God and half human. We're going to see in a moment why Christ had to be fully God and fully human for our salvation to be effective. He was fully man, fully God at the same time. Because the son of man, he could take the place of man. Okay? This is, this is where we come across the fitting substitute. As son of man, he could stand in the place of man. But the son of God, not only was he perfectly holy and perfectly innocent, but his life was qualitatively sufficient to redeem, to purchase back the lives of all mankind and even the whole of the created order. This is why Christ, for him to be, for his death and resurrection to be effective, to bring salvation and forgiveness to the whole of mankind, to the whole of the universe, he had to be fully man and fully God. Because anything short of that would have made him insufficient to carry out what he set out to do. This is why the incarnation was so necessary because like I mentioned earlier without it Jesus God himself could not have bled for us he could not have died for us as one of us so Jesus was perfectly suited to both represent man to God and God to man he was the perfect intermediary the bridge between God and unestranged mankind and this is why when Jesus died on the cross just after he declared it is finished something amazing happened if you're familiar with the gospel there was a huge earthquake you know and uh, and there was uh, you know a splitting of something very important in the temple what was it 
it was the temple curtain. And by the way, it was like uh, it, it, it massive, massive curtain. Like th that's the kind of thing I was referring to you about. The kind of measures that God had to put between himself and mankind in order to be close to us. Okay, in order to cover our sins. Because up until then, there was nothing that could take away our sins. But the moment in which Jesus died, God didn't need to cover our sin anymore. To put anything in between us anymore. And so what happened? The, the curtain in the temple was split in two from top to bottom. And you know that that could only have been done by God. Because, well, if, if you know, this is where not being Jewish and not having seen these things with our own eyes becomes a problem. Because had we been Jews and had we seen the, that veil with our own eyes, we'd know they'd be like this much thick, okay? And I think it's like 30 meter high. It's like an absurd height. And it was torn, not from bottom to top. How many? Oh, 60 feet high. Uh, but yeah, whatever, I don't know feet. Uh, I just know my two feet and that's it. <laughs> and, and it wasn't torn from bottom to, to top. It was torn from top to bottom. So no human hands, no human efforts could have just torn it up. That was God's sign that replicated the high priest's symbol of tearing his own clothes, making himself vulnerable to the sin of man. Right? That was God's way of saying, it's done, it's finished. Now you have full access because now sins are not just covered anymore. They are taken away. And speaking of taken away, this is one of the first few words that we read in the Gospels. The Old Testament revelation was kind of complete and now the fulfillment of it was about to be manifested in Jesus. And one of the first things that we read in, in either of the, uh, um, of the four Gospels is John the Baptist encountering Jesus for the first time when Jesus went to be baptized by him. And what did John the Baptist say? The first thing he said when he saw Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who does what? Who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, you see, now, we would never appreciate those words without knowing the Old Testament, would we? He didn't say, behold the Lamb of God who covers the sin of the world or, or the sin of one individual. <laughs> Like it, it happened back then with individual lambs, one lamb for one person. We're going to see all that in the coming weeks. But he said, behold, the lamb of God is not provided my man. It comes straight from heaven. It's the lamb of God. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Isn't that mind-blowing? It's all in the book of Leviticus. You've been missing out on so much. <laughs> <laughs> so in this series we're going to look at the sacrificial system as presented in Leviticus and the way that it symbolizes what Jesus came to fulfill. We're, only, we're not going to look at the whole book. We're only going to look at the first few chapters that deal with the sacrificial system and then we're going to skip to the Day of Atonement which kind of brings all these uh, sacrifices uh, uh, together in a, in a spectacular way. And we're going to see how uh, the Old Testament and, and the New Testament are two sides of the same coin and how we cannot properly understand one without the other. Because these sacrifices will point toward Jesus, but what Jesus did will also explain the reasoning behind all those sacrifices. It's going to be very, very interesting. With each message, with each sacrifice that we're going to be looking at, we're going to look at an Old Testament example, and then we're going to see how Jesus... Uh, fulfilled that in his own uh, death and resurrection. So in the next six messages, we're going to look at burnt offerings and the theme of consecration, grain offerings and the theme of thanksgiving, peace offerings and the theme of reconciliation, sin offerings and the theme of redemption, guilt offerings and the theme of purity. And then we will finish off with the day of atonement and the work of of Jesus on the cross. So I hope that you get your heart and mind ready because this stuff is going to shed so much light on your 
Gospels. It's going to shed so much light on your understanding of Jesus, of his sacrifice and resurrection and ascension and return. It's going to shed so much light or on your own identity as a son of God. And with this, I would like to just invite the uh, worship team back while I say a word of prayer. Father God, we just want to thank you for your word. We, we want to thank you for that written revelation of the truth. And Father, we, we just want to repent before you for the many times that we've taken your word for granted, the many times that we only read it lightly, the many times that we only stuck to the easy bits or the bits that we liked particularly in view that there are places out there in the world where people don't have access to what we have access to. We have so many Bible translations. We have it on paper format, digitally. We have it on audio version. This, Lord God, we're so blessed with your word, and yet we make so little of it. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we engage with the book of Leviticus, the least read book among Christians, pray, Father, that you would just turn our mindset around, that you would uh, teach us the value of engaging with Scripture, even with the bits that are harder to digest, because they're so full of treasure, because they speak of Jesus from a perspective that we've never really considered. So, Lord, just in the coming weeks, just open our hearts open our minds, give us that thirst for your word, give us that, that hunger to find Jesus in every page of your scripture, that we may appreciate his sacrifice, and that we may, Father, be awakened to that timeless call to be holy as you are holy, that we may be worthy children of, your, of, your, of yourself, O oh God. In Jesus' name I pray.